Hello, everyone. So Joan's already convinced me off stage to join um, Frame, and I'm sure she's going to try and do the same to you guys here today. <laughs> um, yeah, Jesse, editor of UK Tech News, and obviously you are the co-founder, one of the co-founders of um, Frame. So just to start off, what is Frame, and how is it innovating in the health and fitness space? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so like you said, I'm Joan. I'm one half of Frame, and Pip is my business partner. We launched nine years ago, or nine and a half years ago, um, and we were the first pay-as-you-go uh, fitness studio in London. Um, we offer dance, fitness, yoga, and Pilates. We only offer classes. Um, and how we work is we work quite different to the rest of the market. We have um, what we call a frame card, and the frame card is like a wallet where you put 50 pounds on it, and then you use it as if you would go shopping. Um, so that's kind of where we are. OK. And you, it's London only at the moment, but I know that you've opened some spaces recently, haven't you? Yeah, so we launched um, nine years ago in Shoreditch, um, and now we have opened three this year, so it's taking us to the grand total of seven. Okay. Um, yeah, and last year we raised private equity in order to kind of get three open in six months, which is obviously a startup challenge. Okay, and in terms of your background, so you weren't necessarily involved in the health and fitness space prior to Frame, so you were working in e-commerce marketing and advertising, is that correct? Yeah. So how did you come up with the idea of, and why did you come up with the idea, and what was the process of like idea all the way through to execution like? Yeah, so I mean, that's quite a long story, so we'll make this very short. <laughs> um, so uh, history is um, I've got a commerce degree in finance and marketing, uh, and ended up working in TV and radio in New Zealand. Um, that translated to coming traveling to Europe, and then working in um, experiential um, advertising. So um, after four years of that, I kind of thought, I really love it over here, but I'm not sure staying in advertising is for me forever. And I really felt like there was something missing in my life. And what I realized is I'd played New Zealand level sport and quite a few sports my whole life. And I realized it's a really, really difficult thing when you're trying to forge a career working very, very really long hours to actually fit that part of my life in. So. Um, Fast forward a bit, and I met um, my business, now business partner, Pip, and we sort of created something that we really wanted to go to ourselves. So Frame is really, um, really, really comes out of our, both of our passions. Okay. Um, and it's combining sort of the business side with a passion, and I think that's the thing that's kind of got us through the tough times to, that, that starting a business that kind of leads to. What were the most difficult things that you came across when it came to setting up the business in the first place? What challenges? Yes, yeah, so I think um, so. Quite a few. So um, Pip and I were very young when we started. We were 26 and 27, um, and that came with its challenges in itself. Um, you know, it, 10 years ago, this is around the crash time. Uh, we were very much um, an anomaly in terms of entrepreneurialism wasn't a very big thing here. Um, we were very young females, so we had a lot of challenges in terms of. Um, maybe people taking us seriously. Mm -hmm. um, we also did have a huge amount of experience. So I think for those of you out there who are trying to set up a business or raise finance, you know, the first thing they want to see is your CV. And sure. you know, we didn't have a huge amount of uh, experience on our CV. So I think to start up with, I think it was really um, knowing, understanding our product, believing in what we were going to do. And then from there, um, what we do is a very big property play. So the London property market is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so I think and expensive. Those, and very expensive. Yep. Um, so that kind of puts the financing and the property play um, together. And you got a business loan um, at the cusp of the financial crisis in 2008. Now, clearly some of the challenges that you've pointed out in terms of getting people to take you seriously, how did you overcome that on a like personal level? And how did you manage to walk away with the money, essentially? Yeah, so I think um, one of the biggest learnings I've had is, um, and I would um, sort of pass on to people, is, uh, is knowing what your end goal is and knowing what, you're, what you need to do to get that goal. So I think quite early on, we used to get referred to um, at the bank 
as <laughs> the gym girls. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you could see that in one way, um, that it was rather patronising. Um, but actually, we flipped it on its head and thought, what are we here for? What is our goal? What are we trying to achieve? And that was to raise a loan. So um, I think whenever you go into a challenging situation, I think it's thinking about the goal. And, you know, sometimes you have to think, OK, I'm just going to stomach this, or I'm mm. going to... What do I need to do to get around that issue? And in terms of the bank, we um, bored them into submission Good. with a 62-page business plan, which I don't advise anyone to do, <laughs> because the bank will not look at a 62-page business plan anymore. But I think for us, that was us proving ourselves to say, we know what we're doing, we've done the research, sure. we have... I mean, I, I swear they wouldn't have read it. Um, <laughs> but I think for us, that was the sort of the... We, and, and for us, it was like we had done the work. We really knew our stuff. So whenever anyone asked us something, we didn't falter over anything. So I think, um, you know, knowing your goal and thinking, how do I get around it? Sometimes you really want to think, oh, I want to push through this, or I'm going to prove you wrong, but sometimes that's not the best option. Sure. And I have loads of friends, I was saying to you earlier, um, that use Frame and love it. Um, but on that note, who is your target customer? Who, who are you after? Yeah, so I think for us, um, Frame's whole mission and mantra is getting fit shouldn't be a chore. Um, and I think that still keeps us very, very unique in the market. So we're not here to, um, we say we're a lifestyle brand, not a performance brand. So it's not about um, having an eight pack and being perfectly bronzed. Um, it's about a lifestyle and fitting into your lifestyle. Um, so for us, we really look at trying to grow the market. And I think this is what has um, led us to be able to open seven sites, is that we're not looking at stealing from the gym market. And one of the first comments we ever had was, oh, you do know there's a gym around the corner? And we're like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Because you know, the more the merrier. Like, we want sure. to grow this market. There is a lot of people in the market. And I think with startups, sometimes people are very fearful, thinking, oh, you know, where am I going to get them from? Or somebody else starts something similar to yours, and you think, oh, God, what are we going to do? You know, we're going to steal customers. And I think, you know, if you're really sure about who you're targeting. So for us, we really want to grow the market. We want people who um, don't feel comfortable going to a gym. Um, <laughs> we want people who... Um, we have busy lives and want to fit something into their lives or find out what they like. So predominantly we're female, um, 25 to 45 is our, probably our core market. But within that, you know, we really have a lot of guys coming in to do yoga and Pilates and more and more we're seeing people don't particularly mind um, who they're around and the environment they're in. And you've managed to build in nine years like a bit of a, somewhat of a cult following really. How did you go about that? I mean, that's very flattering, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, we often get described as a, as a disruptor brand. Um, and for those of you thinking, um, you know, what does my brand stand for? I think one thing that we've done from the start is um, really stuck true to who we are and what the purpose and mission of the brand is. So going back to sort of the things that, um, the purpose and the why we started the business, is all around variety, flexibility, fun, innovation, mm -hmm. and community. So those are kind of our five pillars. And I think in terms of building a cult brand, you're thinking about what do I stand for? What is my purpose? And then it takes time. You can't just magic a brand overnight. So, you know, we have been around for nine years, but we haven't wavered from our purpose and our mission. And I think clients and, and, and customers these days, you know, they see into a brand now. You know, you can't just change your messaging. You know, you, what you're doing has to be for a reason and you have to do it because you believe in it. So I think having a purpose and having really, really strong to your brand values. Um, so whenever, you know, there's been times in the past when we've thought, oh God, what are we doing? Is this right? Whatever. And we've always come back to actually, sure. why did we start this business? And then your brand always has something to stand for. And so that it's, it's you and Pip, so two co-founders. How do you each play to your strengths and weaknesses? What do you each bring to the table? Very good question. Um, so again, kind of linking back to where we started, um, we kind of just both did everything. We didn't have a huge amount of experience, so we both did everything. We did everything from the reception to the teaching to the finances to the marketing. Um, we sort of say it's, yeah, we were just very much on the job learning. Um, we, had a, we have a phrase still within the company, making it up as we go along. Um, <laughs> so I think with, uh, over time that's evolved and we've kind of, kind of separated out into our roles. But I mean, I would say to people, like depending if you're going into a partnership 
or you're working with someone, it is a really good idea to define roles early. We didn't do it, so we had to go through a period of trying to define those roles. Um, but conversely, would we do it differently? Probably not, because we both know the business inside out because we were younger. Sure. So, you know, if we were starting now with more experience, I would say we should set out roles to start with. But now, Pip looks more after the um, marketing and like brand experience type side, and I look after more the like property, finance, performance, and product. And how big is the team currently? So the team uh, is employed. We have around 65, um, give or take, um, and around 300 trainers. Okay, and what would you say um, sets you apart in terms of like in-house company culture? So I think. We don't have a business without people. Our, 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 jo our business is big, empty spaces, and the people and the music and the vibe all comes from the people. So I think for us, um, it really is about giving people autonomy. It really is about giving people flexibility and giving people a voice. So we don't have office hours. We really encourage people to get out and do things. We try, not to, we try and do our best to make sure that people don't miss important things in their mm -hmm. lives. Um, and a very open, open kind of sharing relationship. So, you know, the team is so great at coming up with um, ideas and suggestions and making things better. And I think that links back to those brand values um, and what we stand for, you know, that, that variety, that innovation and always pushing that envelope. So I think for us, it's really about, you know, giving people the space to do their job. And actually, that brings me on to my next point, because uh, I feel like often having your own business is very glamorized, and people that d haven't <laughs> set up a business, like myself, probably don't realize just how much of your life it takes over. How do you personally deal with like life and work balance? Um, so uh, going back to the Pip and my role situation is we've actually had four children in four years between us. OK. Or um, well, maybe five years, <laughs> something like that. So you know, there's been a huge juggle and a huge a huge learning curve to go through. Um, and I think actually it was one of the best things for the business because when I had my, my son, we really had to change the structure okay. and actually it taught boundaries. Before, prior to having children, it was very much like you had all the hours in the day. You could, if you took your time to do something or you took time out to do class, there was always more hours, you could just finish it at night. But I think actually having children created boundaries. I have to actually turn up to pick up the children from nursery, otherwise that's a bit of a problem. Yep. Um, so I think in terms of the work-life balance, I'd say balance, I, I don't have balance. Um, it's the, good that you admit that as yeah, well. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't. You know, I'm always trying to figure it out. Something's always changing. Sure. Um, we opened two studios in January, and that was completely by mistake. Um, one was supposed to open in October, but the development wasn't finished. So opening two studios and having a one-year-old and a four-year-old is Tricky. not balanced. But yep. you know, it's, a, it's about resetting, recalibrating, making sure that you're doing the most important things, reflecting and being like, okay, the reason I don't ever see my friends is for a short period of time and be okay with it. So mm. I think understanding and looking at yourself in that moment and saying like, okay, so what do I need to prioritize? What and where is this going to take me? I think, um, and then conversely, you know, with the team, it's, it's really great to see people just get up from their desk when they've done their work or go and do classes at lunchtime. And I think it's really important to sort of, um, as founders, you know, be really open for people to sort of create that balance themselves. What's the one thing that you wish someone had said to you um, in terms of advice when you first started the business nine years ago? Putting you on the spot here a little bit, I realize. One thing uh, my dad told me, uh, so my parents, I come from, uh, uh, from, I'm one of six kids, and five of the six all have businesses, and my parents have businesses. It's so kind of a in trend. the family, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but my, my dad said to me, cash is king. Mm. Uh, and while sometimes I push the cash boat a little bit too far, um, as all founders will do, um, I think understanding your cash flow is like the most important. And I don't mean the accounting cash flow. I mean the what comes in and what goes out. Um, and sometimes I think people starting businesses, or if you're working for someone else, sometimes it's like, you know, you don't want to open the mail to see what you've spent. Um, I think it's really important just to stay on top of what the actual cash is. And my dad said, cash is king. Um, and my accountant says to me sometimes, cash is king, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> but that I was think, right. I think, so depending on what you are, it may not be your strength, but having someone who can check in on you and make sure that you are doing those things that you probably don't want to do yourself. I'm, uh, the way that I 
one, fi one thing I found difficult is not having somebody to like check up on you sometimes. You know things that are your weaknesses. So what I do is I tell someone, I'm like, can you make sure you check up on me on this thing? Mm. So that I know that it happens. It's just self yep. self awareness, knowing that I'm not going to do it. It's like I say to my mum, "Mum, can you remind me I have to go to the doctor every day until I go to the doctor?" <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think it's knowing your weaknesses and getting some support on it. And I think you know we can't do everything. So I think remember, cash the king, and and you know find support for those things that you know you're your weaknesses. Like don't hide under a rock. I think that's very good advice. And just to finish up, because I know we've run out of time, um, what's next for Frame in the next year? So, like I said, we've opened three studios in um, six months. So we've gone from four to seven, so almost doubled the size. So this year is all about consolidation, making okay. sure that things are working right, making sure the team is right, um, because culture is so important. And like I said, we run big empty spaces without the people. So, um, you know, we've taken a big step, make sure everything's worked, get it right, and then kind of take those next steps forward. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Joan, and I hope everyone's enjoyed the, the session and lovely to meet you. Thank you so much. <laughs>